Hey everybody, it's Mike Mahadeva the Thunder Wizard. So I am bringing back a video that I made before and I'm going to update it because it still bugs me. It's been bugging me ever since I did it. Um, and that is, we're going to talk about how did Shakespeare talk? What was his accent? What did Shakespearean English, Elizabethan English sound like? And I'm going to go into detail, so sit down and get your popcorn and get ready. Now, for those of you who are coming on here because you're fans of original pronunciation, I want to prepare you. I am going to say things that are going to bother you, and you're going to think that I'm uneducated and I don't have all the facts because I'm not touting the original pronunciation, blah, blah, blah. I, I, I know that. I know that I'm saying something totally different, and especially... This could be my bias, but I'm pretty certain that if you are from uh, Britain, you're really not going to like what I'm saying. And that's because I am going to dig up old conflict between the American colonies and Britain, and it comes out in this discussion. I'm also going to bring some facts to light that are not brought into the discussion. There are some facts that you need to know how to reverse engineer how they spoke. And people aren't bringing this into the discussion, and that's okay. This happens a lot in academia. I have huge, huge respect for academicians. And the academics who have brought the OP, I believe that their intentions are absolutely 100% sincere. And I believe that they are smart people who use uh, critical thinking all the time, but there are facts that are not being brought into the discussion that are distorting their conclusions. Now, there's also, I believe, some unconscious, which means you're not aware of it, unconscious deep historical divisions between America and Britain that are actually uh, fueling a lot of the misconceptions. And there's some um, assumptions that are being made and it's nobody's fault because I've done a ton of research and I've dug up some stuff and now I have no doubt. Before when I did my first one I was 90% sure but there was a 10% doubt. I'm 100% sure now. And I believe if you listen to all of the facts without prejudice, if you're able to put whatever your um, you know academic training about it and it's very logical and what so-and-so said and they're a linguist and a blah 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 if you're willing to put all of your attachment to those theories aside for the moment and listen to some of the facts that i'm going to bring here as well as um, things having to do with how how words are spoken not looking at the text and trying to figure out how it was pronounced but understanding how the voice creates accents and how um, trends, popular trends in societies have a huge effect on how language pronunciation shifts. And I'm going to be speaking to you from um, my, uh, my experience, my extensive experience as an actor who specialized in doing dialects. And if you're just an academician trying to look at how the sounds here and there and you don't understand how and why everybody who has an accent, why they have an accent. If you don't understand that, you won't understand what to me is blatantly obvious now. And I think if you listen to me, it'll become obvious to you. So uh, first thing I want to say here is that everything is based on assumptions. All of your thoughts and conclusions start with an assumption. Somebody uh, gives you an assumption, sometimes without your knowledge, and you accept it or you reject that assumption. So uh, we're going to change the argument here because I have to address the incorrect assumptions. You can choose to accept or reject the assumptions that I give, but I think it's helpful if you take a look at it. Because if you have an incorrect assumption about anything, whether it's language, whether it's history, whether it's science, uh, economics, anything, mathematics, if you have an incorrect assumption, then 
every conclusion that you come to, even if you come to those conclusions honestly and sincerely, if the assumption is incorrect or incomplete, then you are going to have at best incorrect or incomplete conclusions. Therefore, the end conclusion will also be incorrect. And I'm going to show you uh, how the end result is incorrect, and I'm going to correct it for you. And again, if you can get your emotional, any emotional uh, attachments or biases or prejudices you have against certain things, if you can get them out of the way, Occam's razor is going to save the day because you're going to go, yep, that is the simplest answer, and it works. And if it works, don't fix it. So the assumption, obviously, I'm giving here is that Shakespeare, the way, uh, let me be clarify it. One of the ways that some Londoners spoke in the late 1500s was either identical or very close to uh, when you listen to somebody who really has a traditional Southern accent in the United States. Not a modern Southern accent because that's going away. The modern Southern accent is being taken over uh, slowly but surely by standard American. And so there's this new Southern accent, which isn't the same. So you can't use that. And I'm bringing that about because one of the experts did that. He recorded some modern Southern guy who wasn't an actor and didn't know anything about language or accents. And I could tell by listening to him that he was somebody whose accent has shifted because, you, you know, and Southerners will agree. Somebody who's grown up in the Appalachians, if he goes down to you know, Dallas and listens to your basic, you know, urban Southern guy, he's going to go, there's a big difference. I can hear it. I can hear it too. All right. So, so I got so much to get to, but let's talk about assumptions first. So again, just be prepared. I'm going to challenge your assumptions. You might not even be aware of your assumptions or your emotional attachments to your assumptions, but please be willing. If you really want to know the truth, be willing to put it aside. You can come back and pick it up later if you want. So first thing I want to say is obviously my assumption is that Shakespeare, I, I, I'm sorry, I've already said it. One of the accents within London during the time of Shakespeare's writing of his plays was identical or similar to that of a traditional Southern American accent, which nowadays the closest you can get is probably somebody who lives in uh, Appalachia, the Appalachian Mountains. Um, now, that's my assumption. Let's put that aside. Now, in order to be able to, to follow my, my proof and my reasoning here, you're going to have to take a look at your assumptions. So I've uncovered two incorrect assumptions that, are, uh, uh, that academics are operating from. So one is a conscious assumption, which means they are consciously operating from an assumption. And the other one, I believe, is an unconscious assumption, meaning they're not aware that they're being um, stimulated to make assumptions on things they're not even consciously aware of, based on old history between the United States and Britain. So uh, the first incorrect assumption is a conscious assumption, and that conscious assumption is that we can reverse engineer what 1500s English accents sounded like by examining existing modern English accents in England today. Now, if you listen to people who, who uh, the, uh, the academicians who come up with original pronunciation or OP, that's exactly what they do. They go around and they say, well, we have this accent over here and we have this accent over here. Now, one of the things that we all agree on, which is incontrovertible, which we know, is that in Shakespeare's time, uh, everybody in England, actually, that's not entirely true. Northern England didn't have it. But people in London, for sure, used their R's. They roticized, meaning that they pronounced the R um, and in, in, their, uh, in their language. Whereas today we know that that was dropped and that was dropped in the early to mid 1700s. And I'm gonna talk about that because that's really important. Nobody asked the question why. Nobody asked the question, why did they drop their Rs? You have to ask that in order to understand what happened. 
We'll get to that in a moment. We all know that. We all know that uh, in, the, in the 1500s and 1600s and even up till the mid 1700s that um, people in southern England spoke their R's, whatever else, however else they spoke, we know that they pronounced their R's. We know that for a fact. And that they lost it around the Industrial Revolution. So again, uh, in the incorrect conscious assumption is that we can reverse engineer 1500s English accents by examining existing accents around London and England. Now, there's another assumption in there, which I didn't list, and that assumption is that those accents that they are operating from, that they're using, are more authentic to uh, original pronunciation. That is an assumption. And I'm going to, to destroy and disprove that assumption. Now, there's an unconscious assumption. So the, the second incorrect, which is really the third incorrect assumption here by the OP academicians is that there's an unconscious assumption, meaning they're not aware of it, but it is an assumption nonetheless. I know because I grew up in the United States, obviously. And nobody said this to me. This is the feeling you get when you listen to British speakers, when you listen and watch British television, when you um, go over the history. Uh, and that assumption is that America is populated by uneducated people who have distorted the proper English language. So we're looked upon as people who don't speak properly or accurately. We're no, we no longer represent the king's English. That is an unconscious assumption that has an emotional attachment to it. Now that's why people don't come out and say it. You, don't, you might hear that in you know, some kind of biased way, or you might hear that, you know, in some movie, you'll, some guy, oh, the colonial, or whatever. And so the assumption that Americans grow up feeling is that we are uneducated brutes. And so we think that our accent is wrong. I grew up thinking that my accent was not English, that uh, somehow it came out of some strange way. And I remember talking with Canadians and other people who also have a very American sounding accent. But we all came to the conclusion that, well, there was a lot of Irish immigrants. So since Irish uh, sounds very similar to American, and I, I hear that by the way, I'm in Australia right now, so I watch a lot of British television. And so when an Irish person in a British show comes up, it's like, oh, I recognize that sound because he's pronouncing his R's and his vowels in very similar ways that I would, especially if he has a muted Irish accent. You know, like in the, uh, uh, the what is that? Um, the Sherlock series, you know, uh, what's his name? Moriarty has a muted Irish accent. He sounds almost American. And when he would come on, I felt like, ah, I felt comfortable because I understood that. And so it's easy to get the assumption that, well, yeah, that's where Americans got their R's from and their accent from because there were so many Irish immigrants. And same thing in Canada, there were so many Irish immigrants that came over. Except you don't hear that here in Australia. There's a lot more percentage of Irish immigrants here in Australia, a lot of Irish people, but they don't speak with an Irish accent. They don't speak with an American accent. We'll talk about the Australian accent in a moment. All right, so those are the, the incorrect assumptions. Incorrect assumption number one, or I should say unproven. It's an unproven assumption that you can reverse engineer what the 1500s English accent sounded like by listening to and combining and comparing existing modern English accents all over the UK. That's an assumption that is not proven. Uh, this, the unspoken assumption in that is that, that yes, we understand that, you know, upper class British and maybe Cockney is totally different than it was in the 1500s, but these other accents may not have changed. That's an assumption. I'm going to disprove that. Second, unconscious assumption is that Americans are doing it wrong. They drive on the wrong side of the road. They rebelled against 
the uh, the British Empire. They distort the language. They're a bunch of uneducated, you know, redneck idiots. So we don't even bring them into the discussion anymore. They don't. They're they're not even part of it. The interesting thing about that is that if you don't have this unconscious uh, cultural emotional bias, if there isn't this you know unconscious animosity based on our history, which we're going to talk about in a second, um, and you were somebody else, you would go, well, America was founded right after the Elizabethan period. So that's going to be a good time capsule. You know, they were, they, they've been there for 400 years. That's a really good time capsule. Let's go look at them. But the people who come up with OP are people who are in Britain. And so they're not aware, in my opinion, of their emotional attachment to what they see and hear every day because London is still there and the Globe Theater, I assume, is still there. Stonehenge is still there. So they walk around with the unproven assumption that they are more British than Americans. As it turns out, ethnically speaking, like if you were to look at my DNA, I come from like I can trace my lineage through both my mom and my dad all the way back to uh, 1600, you know, back to the very first um, pilgrims who showed up here. You know, my mom, she's not alive anymore, but she had letters from her grandmother who talked about, you know, they had letters from that and talked about the, you know, the voyage over here and they prayed for this and that and there was a hole in the boat and then there was some fish went in the hole. They, the whole, the ship didn't sink and they were praising God and they got to, you know, I mean, so in terms of that, you can't get any more British than me in terms of my ethnicity. I think that's reflected in, in the American accent and I'm going to prove it to you. All right, so here is what I believe the correct assumption is. Now, this is my assumption. I believe it's correct. You can hang on to it. We'll examine it later. My, my assumption is that all modern British accents were massively distorted during the Industrial Revolution, and therefore they do not, none of them, reflect the accurate pronunciation of the 1500s. And therefore, any attempt to use solely modern existing British accents, no matter how different they are, will lead you to inaccurate renditions of Shakespearean accents. Now, the modern OP, as I've listened to it and looked at it, it really doesn't sound um, Germanic at all. It's a brogue. Uh, it sounds like Welsh, Irish, brogue. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's very flowery. And the truth of the matter is, is that Old English would have sounded like that. And so I am not trying to say that Americans are speaking the way that people did in 700 AD. For instance, the Lord's Prayer. If you take, say, like, you know, in Scottish, the Scottish accent the Scots, Scots English, represents a time capsule of early uh, Anglo-Saxon. And they have a very different accent from people in, uh, in England. So if I wanted to read uh, Old English, I would adopt more of a Scottish brogue. So to give you an example, the Lord's Prayer in Old English is, uh, Father Ure, do the earth on heavenum, see the nama yahaluid. To becoma din riche ye worda din willa on eartham swa swa on heaven. Urne ye dai vam liche lof sile us today, and ne ye le do us ankos nunge a kalisas of evil, soth liche. I missed a, a couple of verses in there. But that works really well. If I just sort of adopt a, a, a Scottish brogue and I read Old English, it'll come out. You know, the way, you know, they, they said hoose. They don't say house. They said hoose. They still say hoose. There's a moose in the hoose. There's a mouse in the house. In uh, Scotland. It's a moon licht nicht out nicht. They're pronouncing the GH. It's a moonlit night out tonight. It's a moon licht nicht out nicht. I didn't say ne. I, do, I did ne say. They're still talking in Old English. 
When you're talking about coming out of Middle English into Modern English, America is the time capsule for that. I'm going to prove it. All right, so that is my, my assumption is that if you try and use all British, all modern British accents within England, you are going to get a distorted result because I'm going to prove to you all accents in Britain, save perhaps West English, was massively distorted during the Industrial Revolution. So any attempt to try and use that as a basis to, to uh, reverse engineer is going to come up with a false understanding. And so what ends up happening is the only accents that have an R left to them are the brogues, Welsh, Irish, West English. And so they kind of smash those together and then they've come up and they go, this is what it must have sounded like. But they're still only coming from accents from England. And without taking into consideration that every accent in England has been massively distorted in the past uh, 200 or so years. All right, let's keep going. Now we need to talk about facts. As I already said, before the mid 1700s, uh, English people pronounce their R's. Shakespeare was written during the just before right before the era of the first colonies who came to America. So the English American colonists comprised three different accents uh, because they came from three different, uh, two different areas at least, and three different classes. So the first accent is going to be represented from Northern England and that would have been the eastern seaboard. Now we're going to get to that because the modern eastern seaboard doesn't sound anything like northern English now. Unless you understand how uh, the accent shifted. If you understand how the accent shifted and you apply that shift to all English accents and you just simply go backwards with it, and I'll explain to you how that's done, you land with American. All three American accents, um, the Eastern Seaboard accent or New England accent, Southern accent, and um, what is called uh, Standard American. Those were the three accents that were brought over to the American colonies, or at least the three main accents that stayed. So that represents that that would have been the majority of the population that came over. There was obviously people from other countries and places like that, but in terms of you know, what stuck, those are the three accents that stuck. You've got standard American, which I'm speaking, you have Southern American, and you have, um, you have New England. And I'm saying those are the time capsules, and I'm, I'm gonna prove it to you as time goes on. All right, so the standard American accent probably would have been the middle to upper class and I'm really interested to know, you know, there must have been some ethnic division between, you know, uh, the lower class and the upper class. I don't know what that was. Maybe that has to do with uh, the Vikings that came over, you know, during 1070 AD and William the Conqueror. Maybe that had something to do with it. I don't know. Maybe French had something to do with it. I don't know. Uh, but that's something for another video. Um, so I know from my own history and from the history of just in the history books, New England was populated by Northern English people. That's why the New England accent represents um, Northern uh, English accent in the 16, around 1600. London had two accents, at least, just like it does today. You have upper class or standard British, and then you have Cockney. Back then in the 1600s, you had the upper class, the merchant class, which would have been standard British then, which I believe is what I'm speaking now. And then you would have had uh, the working class, which would have been uh, the predecessor to Cockney, which was Southern accent. I'm gonna to prove to you and show you how they're all connected. All right, so you got that in three accents, Northern, Northern England, and then you have the two accents from London, upper class and working class. And those are reflected in the three accents 
um, traditionally from the United States. Got me? Let's keep going. Now, have you ever noticed that modern standard British sounds artificial? It really sounds artificial to me. And whenever, you know, especially an American wants to uh, emulate, you know, uh, you know, an upper class British, you know, I mean, the, the stereotype of the upper class British with the stiff upper lip is that they've got to stick up their ass that they don't have any, you know, down to earth practical connection to the earth, that they're not very physical, that they're kind of, you know, puftas and, um, you know, they're just really intellectual and all that. Um, and so when you want to express that, you talk like this here, I say my dear boy, I say this war, and what have you. <laughs> well, that might not be uh, just a stereotype. Uh, when I'm doing this, I'm doing a character that's, that looks and sounds artificial. It's, you know, somebody who is putting on airs, as they say, who's trying to, you know, act a certain way. So it's, it's, it's not real. It's not organic. It's a, it's a show. They're putting it on. The sound, and again, those of you from Britain, you're going to hear me, and again, you're going to get, probably get your panties uh, in a bunch. Please don't. It's nothing personal. You know, it's, you're going to see where I'm coming from with this. I am saying that modern standard British is, in fact, artificial. It is artificially imposed speech that has now become uh, it, it's it did its job. It, it was designed to program people to speak a certain way and force them out of their natural speaking uh, accent, which is what I believe I'm speaking now. And I know that for a fact, again, I don't hear OPs talking about this, but it is a fact. During the mid 1700s, when everybody was going through the, um, the something revolution, uh, the, I want to say the techno technological revolution, but the, uh, what do you call that? I've got it written down here. Uh, the Anyway, you know, the whatever revolution, I'll think of the word before, because uh, I got so many thoughts in my head. The uh, Industrial Revolution. Sorry about that. So during the Industrial Revolution, uh, people who were of the working class and the middle class started making a lot more money. And so you had people who were previously uh, lower class or middle class who were much poorer who are now becoming rich. And so there was this push, a very strong push, to change the pronunciation so that you would reflect your new status. Now, this was so, uh, so much de rigueur that there were actually people who were professional accent teachers. I forget their name. There was a name for them. And they went around, and all of the nouveau riche would hire these people to teach them and their children especially how to speak. And that resulted in what now we know as standard British or posh British. And the result of that was they dropped their R's. There were other things that they did like, you know, instead of saying schedule, you know, that was, that was very low class, low class of you. So you would say schedule. You know, you, other things like that. The weekend. Uh, what are you doing this weekend? Uh, yeah. the, there, it was exaggerated and it was artificial because people were actually trying to change the way they came across so that they wouldn't come across as what they used to be because they had shame about their poverty. Now, during this same time, coincidentally, uh, there was major, major problems um, between, major tensions between Britain and the United States. And I'm going to tell you truthfully, now that I've been in Australia for a while, and you know, I'm, a, I'm a, a history buff, I can tell you that I believe very strongly that the United States would not, or the colonies would not have rebelled if it were just about taxation without representation. 
Because honestly, as much of a pain as of, of an ass thing that was, it wasn't that big of a deal. There was much more to it. And what you may not know is that, you know, it's hard for me to figure out because when I think about it, I think, why was there such a big, you know, we were them. We were the British Empire. We were, you know, we were British subjects. We were descended from British subjects. Why was, you know, it wasn't just freedom, you know, from taxation. It wasn't it. Um, there was a lot of oppression um, psychological and social and otherwise from the British. And I'll, I'll give you one example of that. Um, if you've ever heard Yankee Doodle Dandy, Yankee Doodle went to town a riding on a pony. In fact, whenever, you know, if you're watching the television show and they want to talk about the American Revolution, all of a sudden that, you know, that flute sound will come up. That song nowadays is a song of patriotism. And so when Americans hear Yankee Doodle Dandy, it makes them puff their chest out and go, yes, America and the Founding Fathers. And we don't even realize that that song was a joke. That song was written by British soldiers who were, you know, who were occupying the colonies for a long time before the revolution. They were occupying it there and they treated Americans like shit. And so during the revolution and even before the revolution, this song, Yankee Doodle Dandy, was written and that beep, 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 it, it is designed to sound childish and idiotic because they saw Americans as these uneducated, you know, especially ones that were born there, uneducated, hasty, redneck idiots who, you know, were poor and stupid and they weren't British. You know, they were, you know, they looked down on them. And so Yank, a Yankee doodle was a put down. Yankee was, of course, a put down for an American and doodle, you know, is like an idiot, Yankee, a Yankee doodle. And so Yankee doodle dandy, a dandy was somebody who was low class, who didn't have any money, who wanted to look upper class and he looked ridiculous. So Yankee doodle dandy was a song about a ridiculous redneck American. And it was it was sung to humiliate. And so they, you know, the, the British guys, even before the revolution, they'd be walking up and down with their guns and their, you know, their red coats, and they'd be singing Yankee Doodle into town, all right. And, and they would look at the Americans and they'd make fun of them. And so kids growing up for a long time are listening to this and they're getting, you know, this message. By then, the accent shift had, uh, was well underway. And the, uh, the British at that time, the, the working class British would have sounded exactly like Australians to an American back then. There was no difference. That's a time, another time capsule we'll get to. And so there was a clear, you could tell by the way somebody talked if they were British or if they were American. And so there was a lot of resentment towards the British occupiers who treated us like crap. And then there was the Indian American War and um, then Britain had lost a lot of money and a lot of Americans, continental Americans, died in this war against the French and the, you know, the Indians, the French and Indian War, I think it was. And um, then uh, a lot of rich people in Britain got their panties in a bunch because they were broke now. And they, instead of taking responsibility for the money they spent on their national war, that we were a part of, they decided to blame Americans 100%. And that's where this taxation without representation nonsense came into, into being because they were taxing only the Americans. So the, the tea tax, you know, the Boston Tea Party was just one of the dominoes that fell. And after, you know, generations of being treated like crap, of being treated like second class citizens, and now being, you know, having to fight wars for these guys who are over there. This is our land and we're dying and you're over there somewhere. And now you're going to tax us for the war that we died for to protect your financial investments and your financial resources. And now you're going to only tax us for this war. That was enough. And then they blew up. That's where it all started. 
So there was this long-standing simmering tension between Britain and America. And that is when this shift took place. When you had people traveling around London, certainly, but maybe across Britain, who were hired to teach you how to not sound like an American. Because you would have had the lower class people in London who would have sounded like Southerners. Now they sound Cockney. And you would have had, um, you would have had middle and upper class uh, the older who would have sounded like I do now and they would have wanted to change the way that they talked and they would have overemphasized it. Now, let me talk to you about how accents change. I talked about this in my previous video. Please be patient with me. If this is at all important to you, you've got to listen if you want to know the truth. Uh, so in order to do an accent, I know how to do Cockney, I know how to do British, I know how to do German, I know how to do a bunch of different accents and I'm very good at many of them. And the way that you do an accent is not to try and copy an accent. That'll never work. I, you know, I was just watching a movie, you know, I watch a lot of British television and I can tell when they've cast some British guy who does this, his bad American accent. And the way that I know is that he overemphasizes his R's, you know, so he thinks that Americans talk like this. And, um, you know, it's just, it's clearly not an American accent. I was watching Ocean's Eleven and there's a guy in there who plays a Cockney. He's an American guy and he does a really bad Cockney because he thinks to do a Cockney, you have to not pronounce your H's and your R's and you have to not pronounce your consonants. So instead of really knowing how to do a Cockney accent, he tries to fake one and he tries to, you know, uh, cut off his, his H's and his R's and it sounds horrible. But the truth of the matter is, is that a guy speaking Cockney is not trying to do anything differently than I am. He's trying to pronounce all of his H's, all of his R's, all of his T's, all of his K's. The only reason that he doesn't is because of where the sound is placed in his mouth. Now, let's go back, let's review a little bit. So what happened is in the mid 1700s, people who were speaking whatever the English accent was, which was probably very similar to American in multiple ways, northern, lower class, and upper class. What happened is they decided they were going to change the pronunciation. There was a conscious social uh, decision made by the nouveau riche to change the way that they sounded. And there's no doubt in my mind that a big chunk of that was so that they didn't sound American because Americans were slowly becoming the enemy. They were, you know, these colonists that came from here, came from here, and they were now not pulling their weight and they had all of these resources and they're, you know, and so there was a lot of antagonism from the home base against the colonists. And so people who lived in Britain wanted to be uh, patriotic and British. And so they started to change the way that they spoke to them. And the way to do this, the way I'm speaking right now is simply I'm only doing one basic thing, which is I'm talking like this, my normal speech, and I just simply move the sound to the front of my mouth. That gives me a sibilant S. You can hear it as I speak. And you'll notice when you, if you turn the sound off, watch a British person on British television, turn the sound off, and what you will see is that they purse their lips a lot, and it looks like this. That's because, in order to, you know, and of course I'm exaggerating here, but in order to do this, I have to put the, the, you know, the sound at the front of the mouth. Now, when you do that, and you put this accent towards the front of the mouth, two things happen. You lose your R's. Your R's disappear, not because you're not trying to say it. So, you know, when I say the word here, and I say the word here, it's not because I'm dropping the R, it's because with, my, with, the, with the sound up towards the front, there's no room for my tongue and my mouth to create the R sound. Understand? 
So the same is true with Cockney. So Cockney now is, the, is just like it was then, um, the lower class. Now the lower class would have been Shakespeare's. So now we're getting to Shakespeare. Shakespeare would have been speaking lower class British. Now Englanders are pulling their hair out. Oh my God, Shakespeare wasn't lower class. He is this, this magical, and I agree, this amazing genius. He would have been upper class. No. Remember, he was, uh, he was a writer, a playwright, and a director, and an actor during the late 1500s. So we don't realize it now because actors now are part of the elite. Famous actors are rich and famous and they are part of the major elite. But in medieval times, the worst piece of shit on the planet was an actor. If you told your mom, mom, I want to be an actor, it would have been like saying, I want to become a biker thief prostitute. Would have been the worst thing to say. And only the lower classes would be, you know, somebody who had to become an actor because they didn't have, you know, any status and they didn't own any land. And you traveled around and you entertained all the rich people, but you were treated like prostitutes. You were treated, I mean, like the worst scum on the earth. That would have lasted up until the mid 1500s. And so the tradition would have been those people who were actors would have been come from the lower class. They wouldn't have owned anything. They wouldn't have had any estates. They wouldn't have had any pedigree. That would have been better than be, you know, laying brick or being a stonemason, you know, would have been, a, you know, and you would have been able to travel around, but you still would have been lower class. And so that means Shakespeare was writing for the lower class. He was writing in, in speech patterns that would have been um, natural for the lower class. And the majority of people who went to theater were also lower class. Doesn't mean that the upper class didn't come and sit in the upper bleachers there and look down upon them. But the lower class would have been the people there eating and yelling, you know, just like now. What happens in the States now is poor people yell at the screen. Don't go in there! You know, we make fun of, of, you know, different, you know, racial classes, you know, yelling at the screen, but it has nothing to do with race. It's the lower classes. They're into it. They're there. They're responding viscerally. That would have been the case back then in the 1500s when Shakespeare was writing plays. Why do you think Shakespeare did asides? He broke the fourth wall. It wouldn't have been today where you sit and you watch as your Shakespearean actor talks to you about whatever it is he's talking about as he breaks the fourth wall. No, there would have been a lower class actor in a lower class dialect speaking to the lower class and he would have been breaking the wall and he would have been shaking somebody's hand and they would have spoke back to him. And if he had answered, uh, asked a question, they would have answered him. There would have been this back and forth. It was a totally different deal. Uh, so now you get where I'm coming from. So put all that stuff together. Uh, you can't create, recreate OP from modern English accents. Now, I'm going to prove to you all the three accents. It's very simple. All you have to do is take American, each one of these three American accents, and shift the, the, the sound to the front of the mouth. If you start with a New England accent and you shift it to the front of the mouth, you get a completely different sounding accent, which sounds exactly like Northern English accents today. If you take a Southern accent, a traditional Southern accent, and push the sound forward, you get Cockney. And I don't do anything other than just shift the sound. I don't try and change the pronunciation. Pronunciation is exactly the same, I just shift it forward. You take my accent now, you push it forward, and you get standard British. If you don't believe me, try it yourself, all right? So first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna prove it um, with Shakespeare. So let us go, uh, and at the end of this, I know this is a long video, but at the end of this, I'm gonna prove to you uh, by using the OP's arguments, I'm gonna prove to you that they're actually wrong, that, there's, that, that what they're trying to do doesn't work, and what I'm doing works perfectly. 
I can take Shakespeare, even the writing on his grave, which is used as a way to, to explain OP, and just do it in a Southern accent. There's no doubt in my mind Shakespeare had a thick Southern accent. Absolutely guaranteed. All right, let's keep going. So I am going to take a look at that. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to read to you from Shakespeare. Now, I did this in my previous one. I did this. I was actually King Lear a while back. I played this. I loved this. Um, but I remember when I was reading this going, you know, and I had known what I was told. If you don't remember, I was told this a long time ago that if you take Shakespeare and give it to not just a Southerner, but if you take it to a hillbilly in the Appalachians, maybe even if he's uneducated and he's never read Shakespeare before, if you hand him Shakespeare, he will read it perfectly. He won't stutter over any of it. And unlike today, you hand it to your, you know, you know, your, your typical, you know, modern British guy. They, they don't know what the hell Shakespeare is saying. And modern uh, standard American, we, read it, we don't know what the hell Shakespeare is saying. What that tells me is that Shakespeare was written for the lower class, for the, what we now know as Southern because those were the people who were doing it and those who they were performing for. And so let me do it first in just standard American. This is one of King Lear's speech. This is after he comes out of his craziness in the wilderness and he sees his daughter Cordelia, whom he had uh, was estranged with. And, you know, it's a very emotional setting anyway. So he says, pray do not mock me. I am a very foolish, fond old man. Four score and upward, not an hour more nor less, and to deal plainly, I fear I am not in my perfect mind. Methinks I should know you and this man, yet I am doubtful, for I am mainly ignorant what this place is, and all the skill I have remembers not these garments, nor I know not where I did lodge last night. Do not laugh at me, for as I am a man, I think this lady to be my child Cordelia. Be your tears wet? Yes, faith, I pray weep not. If you have poison for me, I will drink it. I know you do not love me, for your sisters have, as I do remember, done me wrong. You have some cause, they have not. Sounds okay. Sounds okay in, in modern English, uh, American English. Let me do a bad, posh British accent. I'll, I'll try and tone it down a little bit. But this is why it sounds horrible. And this is why you can hear this accent is an artificial modern accent that has nothing to do with how they spoke in 1500s English. Pray do not mock me. I am a very foolish, fond old man. Four score and upward, not an hour more nor less. And to deal plainly, I fear I am not in my perfect mind. Methinks I should know you and this man, yet I am doubtful, for I am mainly ignorant what place this is and all the skill I have remembers not these garments, nor I know not where I did lodge last night. Do not laugh at me, for as I am a man, I think this lady to be my child Cordelia. Be your tears wet, yes, faith I pray, weep not. If you have poison for me, I will drink it. I know you do not love me, for your sisters have, as I do remember, done me wrong. You have some cause they have not. Now. It just does not flow trippingly on the tongue, as it were. Speak the speech, I pray you, as I pronounce it to you, trippingly on the tongue. It doesn't come off that way. When you, even if, you know, my bad posh British accent, if you take somebody with a, you know, a, a modern standard British accent and they read it, there are words that are going to pop out that don't sound right. Phrases that pop out that don't sound right. Uh, for instance, uh, you know, just the obvious one here. Um, um, uh, I know you do not love me for your sisters have, as I do remember, done me wrong. Try and say that, trying to say done me wrong in uh, upper class modern British accent. Done me wrong. It doesn't work. It's because they don't speak like that now. And the, the way the sound comes out of the mouth does not work with that. Nobody spoke like that back then. However, you heard it in a modern standard American. It works, but it still doesn't really feel organic. 
this is what made me come to realize that uh, Shakespeare and Shakespearean actors all had lower class, working class accents, which is, uh, uh, which is Southern American. You, all, you heard me do it. Listen to that phrase. You probably didn't even hear it, but it sounds like it came out of a country song. Uh, if you have poison for me, I will drink it. I know you do not love me for your sisters have as I do remember done me wrong. Right? I'm overemphasizing. Um, if you have poison for me, I will drink it. I know you do not love me for your sisters have as I do remember done me wrong. It just comes out that way. Uh, I shared it in the other video, but um, uh, Romeo and Juliet. Uh, soft, what light through yonder window breaks? Tis the east and Juliet is the sun. Arise, fair sun. A guy in the, in the Appalachians would still talk like that. Let me give you another example. Um, incorrect grammar is still the same along these uh, accented lines. For instance, if you listen to an un uneducated Southerner, like a, your, your typical stereotypical hillbilly, they'll, instead of saying was, they'll say were. Or so the, you know, you hear them say, I don't know, he weren't right about that. I don't know, that, it weren't right what he did. You listen to Cockney guys, they do the same thing. Oh, I don't know. It weren't right what he did. He weren't right about that. It's the same accent. The only difference is, instead of talking like this here, you push it forward and you're talking like this here. You see what I'm doing with my mouth? Watch a Cockney guy. Watch one of those, like, watch a British, like, gangster movie with Cockney guys, like a modern one. Turn the sound off. What you're going to see is that they're pursing their lips like this the whole time. And the reason why I'm not saying my H's, and my K's and my T's is because it's too fucking difficult because I've got all my sound in front of my mouth like this here. That's why the TH is an F. That's the same accent. I start talking like this here and I throw it back and I'm talking like this here. And take any word. Pray do not mock me. Pray do not mock me. Let's do it in a Cockney accent. Let's see how it comes across. Pray do not mock me. I'm a very foolish, fond old man. Full score and upward, not an hour more nor less. And to deal plainly, I fear I'm not in my perfect mind. Methinks I should know you and this man, yet I'm doubtful, for I am mainly ignorant what place this is and all the skill I have. Remembers not these garments, nor I know not where I did lodge last night. Do not laugh at me, for as I am a man, I think this lady to be my child Cordelia. Be your tears wet, yes, faith, I pray, weep not, for if you have poison for me, I will drink it. I know you do not love me, for your sisters have, as I do remember, done me wrong. You have some cause they have not. Now, it doesn't quite work, but you can feel it wants to. That's because that is a southern accent being pronounced uh, artificially. It's being artificially forced to the front of the mouth. That's why it doesn't quite work as well. All right. Now, let's uh, do some more here. Let's see if I've got all the things I wanted to talk about. Uh, I believe that I did. Now, let me take a look at some of what the, uh, address some of the arguments that the modern OP guys are saying. So one here is done by uh, Native Lang, and I'm going to give the link so you can go watch it. But l let me play it here. Maybe you can just hear him talk about it, and I'm going to address what he says. I, hopefully you can hear what he's saying. So here we go. Came E, and O was O. Welcome to early modern English. Okay. I don't know if you're going to be able to hear that, so I'm not going to use it. But... He makes the argument here. He, there is a, an inscription on Shakespeare's tomb. And he uh, speaks in what he believes to be reconstructed um, OP or original pronunciation. 
And if you listen to it, it really just sounds like a brogue. It sounds like Welsh and Irish and maybe a tiny bit of Scottish sort of shoved together. That's because OPs, what they've done is they go around and listen to accents uh, in modern Britain that still, that still pronounce the R. They've smashed some things together and they say, yeah, that's what it sounds like. It sort of works. And if you didn't know any better, you would think that's what it was. So I'll do my best. Let me see if I can hear him do it and try and... The dust and claws it up. Yeah, let me try and, and try and, and copy what he does here. Jeez, your sack for bad to dig... Let me see. Go ahead start from the beginning. So let me... Uh, I'll, I'll try and do what he does here, and you'll see how they've come to their conclusion. Shakespeare's tongue. Good friend for jeez, your sack for bad to dig the dust and claws it out. Not here. So that's one of the first things that he says. So he says, good friend for Jesus' sake forbear. It sounds Irish. I'm, mine sounds a little more Irish than his does, but it's pretty close. Uh, let me just read it to you and so you know what the inscription is. Good friend for Jesus' sake forbear to dig the dust and close it here. Blessed be the man that spares these stones and cursed be he that moves my bones. Okay, this is on Shakespeare's tomb. Now, he says, here's how it used to be done. And then he stops. He says, good friend, for Jesus' sake, forbear to dig the dust and close it air. And then he makes this weird argument that comes out of nowhere because the H is written there. But he makes this argument that they didn't pronounce the H. And um, why he comes to that conclusion, I don't know. Let me listen to see if he says something logical. It's one of many rhymes that, well, they aren't rhymes anymore. Clearly. Okay, so he's making the argument which has no basis in anything. And he's, I know he's got this from somebody else. I mean, he's a good, um, you know, he's a, he's a good uh, academician, but I also know he's just parroting what he's heard from somebody else, which makes no sense. Again, the bias, because the H is not pronounced in a lot of modern British accents but it was pronounced in the 1500s, or they wouldn't have written it. They would have gotten rid of it a long time ago. They didn't. It's because it was still part of the language. So he's saying that the word forbear and um, the word here no longer work, but I do agree with him that here was not pronounced here, but pronounced here. So um, if I do his dialect, Good friend, for Jesus' sake, forbear to dig the dust and close it here. There's no reason why the H wouldn't be there. But now, I think he's wrong. Let me put my assumption on it. This would have been spoken with uh, a thick southern accent. And it's going to make everything sound right. I don't even have to try. He has to say, see, there's a difference between forbear and hair they rhymed now they don't that proves this that and the other thing no it doesn't it just means that um, he doesn't speak in a southern accent so he can't hear it i in my normal accent can't hear it either but when i speak in a southern accent i don't have to do anything it makes perfect sense and it rhymes listen good friend for jesus sake forbear to dig the dust and close it here what do you, when you hear southern guys talk, they say, here. What you doing over here? Bring it here. Good friend, for Jesus' sake, forbear to dig the dust and close it here. Blessed be the man that spares these stones, and cursed be he that moves my bones. It works. And if it works, don't fix it. Occam's razor. The most simple answer is almost always the truth. It's clear the United States was founded uh, during, right after Shakespearean times. There were three accents represented, Northern English, uh, upper class, and working class London. And those are all represented when you know how to really just, if you just take it at face value and go, okay, let's look at these three accents. Now we know in the 1700s, there was a massive shift 
a massive conscious shift by uh, all of Britain because it was the thing to do to shift your accent from where I'm talking now and bring it up toward the front of the mouth so that you can sound more upper class, as it were. And all of the things that I normally say, class, class, all I did is push it forward. I take any word and I push it forward and it sounds like upper class English. I do the same thing with Southern. I take any word spoken with a Southern ac accent, I push it forward, it sounds cockney. Now let's talk about New England. That's not represented in this argument because they wouldn't have represented the people in London, the theater goers in London and the actors in London. There wouldn't have been any New England uh, accented people or people from Northern England. There wouldn't have been any there in the theater at that time. Maybe if there were theaters in Northern England, they had their own, you know, whatever, and that would have sounded different. That's why this doesn't work. But I'm going to take now just a really simple word. So if you listen to a guy anywhere in, the, um, in New England, the word lobster, right? That, I'm saying that now in uh, standard American, which would have been standard British 400 years ago, the accent. Uh, the, it, my assumption, if it's correct, would mean that the New Englander accent, the way that they pronounce lobster, would have been how Northern English people would have pronounced lobster in the uh, at, uh, 1600, lobster. Now that doesn't sound anything like modern Northern English accent at all. Modern Northern English sounds almost Scottish. You know, it's, it's, it's you know, love. Uh, and they don't pronounce their H's. All kinds of things are totally different from New England. So New England pronounced their H's. They didn't pronounce their R's. Park the car in Harvard Yard. Is Mar upstairs? Did you park the car? You're going to have lobster? It's wicked. I am of the assumption that that's how they talked when the first pilgrims, my direct ancestors, first got to uh, New England. They, they would have talked like that. So let's take the word lobster. Lobster. If I take my assumption, which is that accent pushed forward is going to sound exactly like modern Northern English now, let's try it. Lobster. 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 Love. Oh my God, I love ya. Oh my God, I love ya. Oh my God, I love ya. Now, I can't do a Northern British accent, but you can hear. That's it. Love. Lobster. 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 It's the same accent. Do you hear that? So now that we can see this in the three accents in America, and we can hear the shift, all we have to do, those of you who know how to do those accents, do that. If you know how to do a Northern England and you know how to do a, uh, uh, a standard New England accent, just take that accent, move it forward. There's no doubt in my mind it's going to sound exactly like a Northern English person today. So now that we have that, I think I've done a pretty good job at disproving uh, the assumptions and OP as it's taught. I'll do one other thing here because there's another, uh, let's see here if I can find it. Oh, there it is. So there's another guy. His name is Simon Roper. And he's, I have a lot of uh, respect for him. He's, he uh, does uh, Old English and talks about Old English, but he is on the same page. Now he's English. So for me, I think he's got a bias without realizing it. It's not a conscious bias. He doesn't seem like a biased person. He seems like a, a, you know, a scientist who really wants to look at the truth and understand it. But uh, he has here uh, something from William Shakespeare. And he does something, and he, he's kind of disingenuous about it because whether he heard it from me, because it sounds like he's responding to my video, my earlier video, or whether he heard it from somebody else, I don't know. But he's saying, no, that's not actually accurate. That Southern accent would not have represented Shakespeare. And what he does is he finds some guy who's, you know, a, a, a Southern guy, modern Southern guy, who doesn't have a really deep Southern accent. 
And this is something that you need to understand because what's happening now in the States is what happened in England. In the States now, a lot of Southerners are losing their accent. They're, they're muffling it and they're, it's because there is an unconscious bias. I know because I have it. Um, people who have, you know, are dipped from different parts of the country, I'm just being honest with you, we look down on Southerners. We see them as uneducated, you know, rednecks, uh, gun-toting, you know, uh, all of that. And so when a Southerner moves to a big city, there is a push, especially if they move to a big city, there is a push to lose the Southern accent. So this guy got some just average guy with a Southern accent and had him read this. And then he said, uh, and here's what it would have sounded like. And then he took an actor who had been trained in OP and the OP guy did it. And of course the OP guy sounds much better it's because he's a trained actor, a trained speaker, and he's mastered this you know, OP, which I think is a slight misunderstanding. But let me now do this in, uh, again, a Southern accent. This is from Macbeth. And you're gonna hear that it sounds, it, it comes out very comfortably. Is this a dagger which I see before me? The handle toward my hand? Come, let me clutch thee. I have thee not, and yet I see thee still. Art thou not fatal vision sensible? Now, what he does in that is he makes this argument that, that it doesn't rhyme. So the other guy did it, it didn't rhyme very well. But when I do it, I'm a trained actor, and I do it with a southern accent. I see thee still, still rhymes with sensible. Is this a dagger which I see before me, the handle toward my hand? Come, let me clutch thee. I have thee not, and yet I see thee still. Art thou not fatal vision sensible? To feeling as to sight? Or art thou but a dagger of the mind, a false creation, proceeding from the heat oppressed brain? I see thee yet in form as palpable as this which now I draw. Uh, so he also focuses on the word creation. And he comes up with this idea that it was uh, creation. That sounds about right, but it, the only reason it approximates is because the Irish brogue has similar sounds to Southern American. Now, the word creation or the word creature was originally pronounced creator. And what do you hear, hillbillies? They say, oh, you see that critter over there? Yeah, we're going we're to go shoot us a critter. They're still operating from that old English. And so when they say creation, it's going to sound, it's going to have the same intonations almost as an Irish bro. Creation. Whereas I say creation, it gets lost. A, a modern British guy, creation, gets lost. Cockney guy, creation, gets lost. But that, that, that typical twang is in there if you have an Irish brogue or if you have a southern. Point I'm trying to make is that you, if you just take a southern guy with a deep southern accent who can act and can um, speak, is a trained speaker, you give him Shakespeare, it's going to sound perfect. Yonder, you done me wrong. These things flow right out of the mouth, okay? So uh, I butchered a lot. I've tried to say what I wanted to say. I think I got through all of it. I'm going to have links here, but I'm sorry, OP. Let me go again. Let me come at you with the false assumptions. The false assumption number one, that you can take modern British accents anywhere in Britain and uh, reverse engineer 1500 English accents. The uh, missing assumption is that you assume that accents in Britain have not gone through a huge transformation. They have. In the 1700s, the upper class London shifted their what now is standard American, pushed it forward, and it was artificial and it was forced. The rest of England followed suit. So the Northern English, who would have sounded like lobster, tried to do it, and they said lobster. They would say love, 
I don't know, how, do you, how, does, a, how does a New England guy say love? My God, I love ya. I love ya becomes a love ya. You push it forward. Uh, the Southern guy. Oh my God, I love you. Oh my God, I love you. Did I do that right? Oh, I don't know, I love you. Yeah, something like that. Let's take the word nation. Southern guy says nation. Cockney guy says nation. Same thing. Am I making sense? Do it. Those of you who know how to do it, do it. Take standard American, push it forward. Don't try and sound British. It's going to be, you know, a little stilted at first, but you're going to end up getting it and you're going to feel that you are speaking upper class British and you're not trying to change any pronunciation. You just shifted the sound. Same with Cockney. Do a Southern. If you guys are Southern, take your Southern accent, push it forward, you'll sound Cockney. If you're from the Northeast, take your Northeast accent in the U.S., push it forward, you're going to sound like Northern British. Guarantee, if it works, don't fix it. That's all I got. If you lasted this long, then you have my respect. All right, talk to you guys later.